Hello, I'm Dr. Lisa Belial, and you are listening to or watching Radio Maine. Today I have with me in the studio, artist Cooper Dragonette. Thanks for being here. Good to be with you. And this is the second time that you've joined me here in the studio, so you're obviously uh, an, an experienced um, entertainer when it comes to this space. I hope so. Well, I'll try to be. Yes, yeah. which is kind of goes along with the the work you used to do with the children you used to teach. Yeah, there's definitely a level of entertainment and keeping uh, people's attention for a little while anyway, until they, you know, their eyes started to glaze over and you realized you had to step off the stage and let them get to work. Yes, yeah. that's true. I mean, you are, you're actually particularly good at giving artists remarks, for example. I know you have a show up and at the Portland Art Gallery and and you seem quite poised. You seem to have no problems with oh, interacting thanks. with thanks. the group. But yeah, that's... I was pretty nervous about that. Yeah. Really? Yeah. You know, I think it's interesting because I, I did I used to teach in front of a classroom or if I taught Outward Bound courses way back when, you did a lot of public speaking. And I think you just have to get used to public speaking in that situation. It's just a daily thing. But maybe because I hadn't done it for so long, I was really anxious about it. That whole week leading up to the, the art opening uh, Thursday night, I was just, yeah, I was sweating before I went up to speak that night. Definitely. So do you think if you had been in the mode and you had been doing public speaking and it was something that recently you had just kind of been practiced at, that it would have been any different for you? Maybe, you know, I, um, and maybe you know this from your role as well. It's like that nervous energy is sometimes really good. And when it's not there, it's like, what am I, where is it? Well, how, you know, what am I going to go on? And then there's nervous energy that sort of paralyzes you. Um, but there was a great, uh, we did a great workshop at the gallery with, uh, with Dietland Vanderskoff. And she talked about that, that nervousness is just energy. And I do try to remember that. That was a, that you know really rang true for me. But um, yeah, public speaking is is different. It's really different. Yeah, it was, but it was fun. And uh, you know, it's always fun to make uh, you know a group of people in a room laugh. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Feels like you're off to a good start. Beats the alternative, right? Right. Yeah, crickets. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or making them cry. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Which, or they leave. Yes. Yeah. Right. That's even yeah. worse. Yeah. Well. You know, you're you're bringing up something that's, I think, not that unusual for many people who are in the art field, which is that you're asked to interface with the public and do it in kind of a big way every yeah. so often. Yeah. And that's not always comfortable for people. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's a pretty solo pursuit. Um, it, it definitely, um, for myself anyway, it's, it's very quiet, very solitary. Um, Maybe sometimes I'll be listening to a podcast or music, but you're definitely locked in with your own thoughts and decision making process. And then um, at some point of the day, you got to you know put down your brushes and and sort of step back into the rest of the world. Uh, and that takes a little adjusting, um, but the the day to day is is pretty solitary. And I love that about it. I love the the quiet and the sort of focus that you get just from being alone with a painting or a couple paintings in the studio or working plain air. It's, yeah. It's, it's, I feel pretty fortunate to have that as part of my regular daily routine. I remember when I was doing a lot of writing and not <clears throat> as much doctoring yeah. and, uh, and in the kind of the emergence, it was, it was like being a sea monster almost and kind of like rising up out of the depths of the ocean yeah. to actually interface with human beings right. on the planet. Yeah. It was that very weird feeling that, oh, I actually have to use my mouth and form words to talk with people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I often don't answer the phone during that space, which is a good and a bad thing. I mean, I, I guess I look and see who's calling, um, but I don't want that. I don't want to break the spell almost. Right. And so stepping out of it, for any reason, it um, yeah, it takes a while to get back into that groove. I guess you're just in the zone, aren't you? You just get into the zone and you don't want to step out of it because things are going well. Um, and, I, and I find like listening to music or listening to a podcast, I, you can't do it with writing. At least I couldn't. Maybe music, but um, especially listening to a good podcast where somebody's talking about an interesting subject 
it seems to take away some element of the, um, I don't know, the critical part of painting. Cause it's, you know, every brushstroke is like making a decision. Every color choice is a decision. And it's so easy to start beating yourself up about it and easy to, you know, think it's going in the wrong direction. And there's something about having that other voice, you know, in your ear while you're listening to somebody else speak. I don't know. It seems like that is, has been very helpful for me anyway in in just staying out of the weeds and, and, and you know, feeling like the painting is heading in a good direction and I'm not kicking myself the whole way through it. So, yeah, that's always kind of an interesting process is to have have that going at the same time. I, I almost purposely now try to get something going to listen to when I start a painting. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's so fascinating because I'm, I'm actually kind of, I'm envisioning Cooper's neurons that are like, kind of just like, it's almost like you're babysitting them somehow. Like the the critical neurons on this side, they're, they're listening, they're occupied. You know, it's like the the children, you've sent the children off to Sunday school and they're going to go do their thing. Yeah. And then you're going to be able to do your other thing over on the other side of your brain. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I, you're just reminding me that sometimes, I mean, if you walked by my studio, you'd think, why is that man dancing while he's painting? But if that, if there's like a really good tune playing or an album, um, it, it all sort of seems to uh, work together. You know, the, the painting process, good music, um, it, it becomes fun for sure. Um, but I think it becomes fun because you, I've tuned out that that critical part of my brain that's, you know, saying this is terrible, this is awful. You should put this, you know, in the in the garbage. Start over. That seems to have been tamped down by whatever I'm listening to. Yeah. I mean, that's that's such a funny thing that I think that many people who try to have more than one existence often struggle with, and I I know that for me. I can do an excellent job incorporating creativity into my day-to-day life as a doctor and as a healthcare person. Um, But it's very hard to then move back into the creative space and kind of free things up because you're called to do more analysis on one side. And it's hard to leave that analysis behind if you're not wanting to any longer <laughs> analyze. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, right. It, that seems to go right to right brain, left brain sort of processes. And and there's some, I don't know, I wonder what side of the brain fun lives on. Yeah, but the, the dancing that you're the describing. The dancing and music and yeah, that all seems to be just fun. Um, um, I recently in the studio, um, I found basically my old like college stereo. And usually when I'm listening to music, I am listening to it on a set of headphones. So it's quiet. Nobody upstairs can hear music. It's, you know, sort of in, right in my head. But I found this old stereo I had in college. And I was like, oh, I wonder if this still works. So I, I hooked it up. I got it all set up in the studio. I was, I was adamant that it could not take me any longer than 10 minutes if I can't find all the wires and I'll just put it in the tr- in the car and take it to the swap shop. But I found everything and I found figured out a way to hook up the, the iPhone to it and I turned it on and it worked and it was great. And it was like, oh, this is fun. Big volume. It's really fun. So I turned it really far up, really far. And I got to like the end of the first song and I thought that beat that's coming through the speakers, that doesn't match the song. And I, and I kind of kept looking around this, at the stereo going, what's the matter? And then I realized there's a man standing at the back door, pounding on the door, telling me to turn it down. It's my oh. backyard backyard neighbor. Oh, no. <laughs> Whoops. And I just told him, I said, you caught a 50-year-old man in an 18-year-old, 18-year-old moment. It's never going to happen oh, again. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So I've gone back to the headphones. I've gone back to the headphones. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, and ultimately, your neighbor was okay with that conversation? Yes. Yeah. I think he realized, like, it wasn't. You know, my 14-year-old son, it was an, a fairly responsible adult that was trying out his old college days well, stereo. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you are. That is something that um, 
honestly, I actually kind of miss, I actually kind of miss that, that ability to just turn things up and yeah. have it be so loud that right. you're, you can just be, you can just kind of forget everything. Yeah. You're in it. You're in it. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. I, I think that's the other thing about being an adult is that you end up you're, you have to pay the mortgage and you have to make sure your kids get to school. Right, right, and yeah. Like there's just a set of things that you just have to get done. Yeah. That's just the nature of that. Yeah. yeah. But, but something that can bring you back to that yeah. pounding beat that's not your neighbor. No. And I think that's, you know, in some ways like work is, is, I like what I do because maybe you get to step away from all those things and I enjoy that. Right. I don't have the responsibilities that we all do while I'm working. Um, and there's some element of like, it's, it's definitely work. Um, but it is fun. I do like it. I enjoy going to the studio or, you know, setting up outdoors someplace to paint. Um, I, I think I took a workshop years ago and somebody said, well, if you're having fun, you're doing it wrong referring to painting and i thought yeah that's it is hard there's something about it that's difficult and um you struggle through it uh maybe now at this point i've learned enough about the process that i kind of know what's going to happen or if it doesn't start off on the right foot you just know it's not gonna it's going to be a struggle to get to the end or you didn't prepare well enough for it so um, yeah, that business of like enjoying the work and then struggling, um, to make a good painting, it's still all a nice place to be at the end of the day. You know, it's, whether it's the studio or outdoors, it's an, it's a nice place to stand for a long time. I mean, isn't it, a, isn't it strange that this idea that, that struggle isn't enjoyable? I mean, to right. say that right. that if it's fun, you're not doing it right. Well, right. but can it be fun to be doing something that's somewhat complicated and maybe doesn't isn't intuitive? Like, can can't the struggle be itself a source of some enjoyment? I think there's satisfaction for sure when you've when you've maybe tackled something more difficult than you thought you could handle, or I think that's probably where the breakthroughs come. Um, you know, if I just kept making the same painting over and over again, I think I'd be bored. Um, might still be fun, but I do like the challenge of something. And I think I often choose stuff and think, can I do that? Um, you know, it'd be like going for a run. And if I had trained to do a 10 K, okay, I could probably do a 10 K. But then if I hadn't trained for a marathon, you know, am I really setting myself up for failure because I'm not ready to do that? There's, I don't know, there's some element of, 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 the the hard parts of it that um, can be frustrating and defeating. And there, there's there's a lot of paintings in the studio that will never see the light of day. Let's put it that way. <laughs> they they didn't go well. And there's probably you know there's probably paintings out there that have paintings underneath them uh, just because they didn't they didn't turn out in the direction they thought they were going to go. So um, that just that's just painting. I think it's it's like writing, right? Writing is rewriting. And that's painting. Painting is just, hopefully you do a lot of that though in like a sketchbook or on a small scale so that you, you basically do all your rough drafts and first drafts in paper, on pencil, you know, just quick, easy. And maybe you've worked out a lot of the problems. So when you get to the, the canvas, it's not so, the, the problems haven't, haven't been worked out yet. It's, it's good to have that flexibility in, in the work that you do, because I think, you know, that's actually one of the interesting things about being in a professional job, whether it's being a teacher or whether it's being a doctor, is that uh, you don't have as much latitude to make mistakes. There's not really as much of a sketchbook that you can right. be like, oh, no, sorry <laughs> right. about that. I didn't get what, that one right. Yeah. Uh, sorry I didn't teach you correctly this whole last year of math, but right. yeah. um yeah. I guess I'll just work on the next student. Right. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, the diagnosis was this yeah. and I gave you that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I think there is something really important about the ability to experiment and the the ability to kind of keep moving forward yeah. in, in a direction. Yeah, yeah. I suppose in that sense, you don't have that maybe in other 
fields. But I always think every painting is just practice for the next painting. And so you try to take what you've learned from the last painting and bring it into the next painting. And I suppose when people ask me what's what's my favorite painting, it's usually the one I'm working on right then or the last one I just made. I think because I've, I've weeded out all the other stakes that I see in the other paintings. And maybe I don't yet see the mistakes in the most current painting. Um, but, you know, if, if, if you look at a body of your own work, I, I tend to just focus on what's wrong about them, what's missing, what I didn't do well, right? I just see all the glaring errors. Um, but I think that's more of an internal, like, I could do better. I have to figure that out still. You know, there's still room for improvement. And, and, and that's maybe what, what makes every painting kind of a, an interesting thing, an interesting process is just what's going to happen in this painting that I never saw coming. So there's, there's always some other layer of the onion to, to get to. Yeah. So as we're talking about things that happen that maybe were unexpected, what about the piece that we have in the studio here with us today? Well, that, um, this painting is really more of a painting from say my imagination or my memory than other pieces that I might do on site or paint, um, paint from images that I've photographed or drawn. Um, this is an Island way down the coast, uh, near the Canadian border called Libby Island. Uh, it's, it's pretty remote. You're pretty far from shore here. Um, and it was one of those islands that I never saw that often, but it always had this presence, even at a distance, um, you know, it was pr- nobody lived on it anymore. Uh, the lighthouse was now automated. Um, no trees, you know, just a, a, a tall grass covered island. Um, I just loved all those outer islands uh, when I worked for Outward Bound. It was just that was where I wanted to go. I always wanted to go farther out. You know, where, how far out could we go? Uh, when we were, you know, little boats that were like lifeboats, uh, often we had to row them to get to where we were going. And and the outer islands were always the most interesting. Either they were barren, um, you know, unoccupied anymore, preserved or islands say like Matinicus or Monhegan, these island communities that were fairly remote. That they, you know, most of the time those populations dwindled down to just a few hundred people, a couple hundred people in the winters. Uh, and the farther down east you went, the fewer in people there were on those outer islands. So it, I just always um, was drawn to those those places when when I first learned about the coast of Maine. This, it, the remote, the remote remoteness of it. Um, and so this piece here, um, it all seemed to come together fairly quickly. I mean, I, I think I knew how I wanted to compose it, but then I struggled with things like the water and the, the texture of the rocks in the distance. Um, I know I painted that water in the foreground three or four times, just never, even after I got it framed, I thought I was going to bring it back home and fix it again. But maybe there was some, um, a little time between having dropped it off at the framers and then picking it up again. I thought, oh no, it's okay. Like it's it's fine as it is. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna make it any better with the tools I have and the abilities I have. Um, since that's as far as I could get with it. Uh, and then the other thing about this piece is, I don't often paint figures in my paintings, and I and I usually don't make them fairly prominent. Um, but I like the solitary aspect of this one lobsterman, the island, this house that, you know, is it a house? Is it just a, a shed? Is there anybody in it? Um, yeah, that's not a dynamic I usually, I put into paintings, but I did like, I did like that connection between the island and the lobsterman in this one. So when you saw Libby Island, was there actually a lobster boat next to it? Was there a guy oh. in a lobster boat? No, that's probably just, again, like just, these are just components of memories. Um, you know, a lobsterman working on the coast way out away from shore, down east. Um, it's amazing when you go down east in a sailboat or uh, 
probably even by land. Uh, once you get past Acadia and Bar Harbor, it's a totally different coastline. It's it's a different population. It doesn't seem like tourism reaches that far past it. Um, maybe more so now. It's been a while since I've spent a lot of time down there. Um, but as soon as you got past Acadia, it was rare that we ever saw another sailboat. And so the only people we would see were lobstermen. And they came from towns like Korea or Goldsboro or Jonesport. Um, and... Th- those were the only other sort of humans you you saw while you were out in those outer islands. Um, it seemed like that was you know that was their backyard, and you were just traveling through it. Are you telling yourself as you're creating your pieces? Are you telling yourself a story? Are you are you trying to? I know that you do a lot of work that's outside and, yeah. you know, landscape oriented. So yeah. that's a story of a sort. Right. But this seems like a different. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like, um, I feel like my work is, I don't know if it's taking a turn or it's just on a tangent right now, but um, painting plein air often feels like I'm recording the, that moment when I'm there. And there's some element of it feeling a little bit like painting a postcard. And one of the things we talked about recently at the gallery was 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 the idea of, of memory of of missing things. And so I think the the driver of a lot of my work, at least in this latest body of work, is that idea of missing things um, in memory. And I just don't see these things anymore in my day to day. But they were magical when I did see them. You know, they really resonated with me. Um, um, I always talk about this sunset that I saw in Matinicus Island one night uh, when we were working with Outward Bound. And it's still the best sunset I will ever see. I've, I've just given up looking for a better sunset. It was the best. Um, and there was a lot of moments when you were up early or up late um, where you saw stuff that just... Um, you had to be there more or less. And, and so moments like this, maybe I didn't see this moment exactly, but there were just a lot of times when we'd be up at sunrise uh, or still sailing after the sun had gone down. Um, and you really felt like you were out there all by yourselves. So then a lobster boat or somebody else showing up, it really stuck out, you know, um, it just became a part of the scene and part of the memory. Um, I don't know, you know, when, when I will be have time to go back to those those parts of the coast, I don't know, but uh, they definitely left their their imprint on my on my memory. I remember when I was going through a certain phase of my life that um, had changed. I just had gone through a very big upheaval, um, and there was a certain element of returning back to pick up things that I had almost kind of left like breadcrumbs to my past life in the sense that um, it wasn't as if I had emerged not whole from that past life, but, but somehow I was becoming more integrative of my entire self when I went back to that. Right. So as you're describing this and you're describing this, this missing piece, I I have the sense that, you know, it is entirely possible to be living a, a life that you thoroughly enjoy and also and also, yeah. there's that that yeah. past sense yeah. of yourself that somehow still is kind of wandering around on its own. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's um you know as as a parent, there's always this sort of before and after, right? Um, maybe marriage before and after. Uh, so yeah, there's some element of this all having been some element of my life before before what I don't know kids, wife, house, mortgage, dogs. Um, but it was really important at the time. You know, the work, I loved the work. Um, it was impactful. It seemed to have made life-changing experiences for a variety of people. But selfishly, I was, I loved it. I loved, I loved seeing the coast. I loved sailing it. I loved exploring it. I loved knowing uh, islands, you know, by name, even, you know, even if I, I, um, only saw them once or twice. It was like I could stand in one spot and name islands. Um, and, you know, you just got to know 
the coast of Maine, like you know your home, like you know your hometown, um, and that was pretty cool. I, that was just nothing as a kid from Connecticut that I had ever experienced. You know, I knew I knew my the roads names of my town, but now I was knowing these huge geographical spaces and um, you know the depths of water and uh, where certain rocks were hiding under the water, and so that was that was yeah that was different. That was cool. It's and I. Um, and if, you know, we've tried to show our kids a little bit of that. Um, and that seems to be probably the best way to get back out there is to, to charter a sailboat and go, go out with the family. Um, but we're not up at five in the morning and we're definitely <laughs> not sailing through the night. So it's different. It's definitely different. Well, you also, your children are teenagers at this point. Yeah. Just, just barely one teenager and one 11 year old. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know how interested they're going to be in it with mom and dad showing them around. It might be time to put them in a, in that outbound boat and send them off. Yeah. Yeah. That's a thought. It's getting there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've become one of, I believe one of the best selling artists at the Portland art gallery oh, as your great. art has continued to evolve. I don't know. Maybe you don't yeah. know that. Maybe I'm not allowed <laughs> to say that, but here we are. Here we so are. Yeah. there you go. Yeah. Um, and this has been for you um, a very specific choice. You had to actually say, "Okay, I'm I'm going to focus on this right now. Yeah. This is what my life is going to look like, and yeah. um, maybe it's a little scary, but this is the direction I'm going in." Yeah, I mean, I, I I would be I would be in trouble if I didn't say that I had help, um, and my wife Jill was you know hugely supportive and still is hugely supportive. Um, and supported me through all those times when paintings didn't sell or they sold for, you know, I made little paintings and sold them for a little money. And, you know, we you know, sit down at the kitchen table and do the books. I'm like, is this really working? Is this not working? Um, you know, thankfully I had, I had a teaching job at the time. So it afforded me some flexibility to sort of manage both things at once, painting and teaching. Um, and so that, carried me through and, and continued to carry me through with kids and schedule. Um, um, but yeah, uh, it was, it was definitely a leap. Um, and even now, um, you know, a painting like this painting, which is again, more from imagination than say, uh, a postcard documentation of Portland headlight or, um, you know, some corner of Acadia. Um, it feels like I'm taking a risk this is, this is something that I came up with. And so I don't know if it's going to resonate with anybody when I'm making it. I don't know if somebody's going to go, well, that's, I don't know what that is. That's a lobster boat and some funny house on an Island. I, I don't know where this is. I don't know what this is. Um, so I guess maybe t just taking that, that roll of the dice now with, with experimenting with different ideas of, of what a painting of the main landscape can be for myself. Um, that feels a you know more of a, a different approach, but I still love making just um, just a straight landscape painting, just recording what I know, um, making making paintings of places that I know, places that I'm familiar with, places that have meaning for me. Uh, I tend not to like travel with my paints or go on vacation with paints. Um, I just don't know, you know, to to step onto some. A landscape that I've only known for a week on vacation and then try to make a painting of it. Mm, that feels, it feels sort of forced at some, at some level. But it's, it's so, it's so fascinating that to you putting yourself into the piece more through your imagination right. involves risk. Yeah. Because really everything that you do is one big risk and yeah. it's all really involving pretty significantly your imagination. Yeah. 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 I mean, I guess as artists that you're right, we just sort of throw it out there and hope it resonates with somebody. And that's maybe the risk. Um, I, yeah. Um, how risky can I get though? I, I, I really love the work of this uh, Cuban American artist named Julio Larraz. Um, He's a fairly well-known painter, and he's been well-known for a long time. Um, and he'll paint scenes that are reminiscent of, say, a Wyeth composition, whether it's Andrew or Jamie. Um, 
But his most recent painting, I was sort of shocked, was it was like a painting of the space station. Uh, and at first glance, you think, oh, this is some kind of abstract black and white image. But then you realize like, oh, no, this is a space capsule like at the space station. And, and I just thought, wow, that's really risky. That's really taking a leap. Um, you know, and I loved it. And I thought, could I ever do that? Could I ever start painting paint sta- uh, space stations? Who's going to want to paint a space station painting over their fireplace? <laughs> uh, that's, you know, that's the sort of moment when you feel like you're pulling the reins back on yourself. Um, as much as I loved his painting, I, you know, could I do it? I don't know. I don't know if I could pull it off. It, it was, that was really cool. So it might be more something I do for myself. Um, but that was a big risk. Space stations. I don't know. <laughs> well, well, I think you're, what you're saying is, you know, what is it that people will be able to relate to? Yeah. So you're, you're, you're kind of making a guess as to the possibility of the collective unconscious, right? You just, yeah. you just don't really know necessarily, you know, where your own head is at, you know, where the people around you yeah. somewhat, where their heads are at. Yeah. But what, what is it that's going to somehow appeal to others? Yeah. And, and that, that is kind of uncertain. Yeah. I, <clears throat> you just reminded me of a conversation I had with Emma Wilson at the gallery, because I was asking her about, a couple of subject matters, a couple of topics that I thought, is this, is this going to work in the gallery? I think it was really just like winter paintings, snow paintings. And I said, you know, just what do you think? Should I, should I do it? Should I include it? Not include it? And she just wrote back, just paint what you love. And I thought, oh yeah, right. That's, that's the, the best approach. Just paint what you love. I don't know if that's going to take me down the road of space stations, but it's a good one to fall back on is just paint what you love. Well, you know, it sounds a little cliche, I think, yeah. and I'm not, not Emma, I'm sorry, I don't mean you're a cliche, that is not what I'm saying. What I am saying, though, is that having spoken to various people over time, artists, non-artists, I do think that when you get to that place where you're doing something that is that is you, and that, that you've kind of got this softness around it, you know, yeah. it's the, the Mary Oliver idea of, you know, letting the, the animal love what it loves. Yeah. I do think that that kind of brings you to this this place that other people recognize right. and see as this this sort of highest version of yourself. And who doesn't resonate with that? Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. Um, yeah, painting what you love and painting what you know, or yeah, you know, I suppose it goes, it's true for writing, right? What you know. Um, yeah, I guess it's the connection. It's the key. Yeah, um, I, I would definitely need to feel the connection to the place or the image or the the moment um that that to me would be you know the the key, one of the key ingredients to making a successful painting um and and to not have that in there could really undermine the whole thing it's you know part of the foundation for making a successful painting is painting what you know for me anyway yeah but then it's always the question is what i know and what i love is this something that people will see as being something that Right. they could know and love right that they could connect with and yeah. that's actually kind of it seems like more of a risk that you're putting yourself out there as a human being and saying okay what do you think of me <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know yeah. and i think we all have that kind of basic human need to feel accepted yeah it's like telling a joke i mean if you think it's funny is everybody else going to think it's funny so i i guess I, yeah i'm i'm trying I, i'm not i'm definitely not um unconscious of the fact that this is going in front of an audience uh and how are they going to feel about it and will it resonate you know would i want it in my own house um you know would i think it's a funny joke would i think it's a a great story uh you know what i i guess i'm always i'm always looking at painting as analogies for something and painting could be cooking painting is building a house um and all those things. And so all those ingredients that go into making a great meal or building a home, that's all there in painting as well. You know, it's got to have a strong foundation, uh, but the details matter. Um, the composition is key. Uh, presentation, all of that seems to be important in making a painting. And, and then whether it resonates with somebody or not, I suppose that's up to them. If they think it's a, a good looking painting or want, if they want it in their home. That's always the sort of um, uh, 
that's the that's the best award of all is when somebody decides to to bring it home with them that's the best oh okay that really that worked okay you you like it enough to bring it home with you that that feels pretty good well i've enjoyed again our conversation i think every time i talk to you i learn a little bit more and also <laughs> um i i think you're talking about things that many of us can relate to, especially people who have lived a certain number of <laughs> years yeah. on the planet. Right. You know, I think it's it's just kind of a common thing that happens over time. But sometimes taking the time to reflect on it, I think, is yeah. something that we don't do. Right. No, not enough anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So I appreciate your willingness to do that with me today. Thank you for having me. I've been speaking with artist Cooper Dragonette. You can see his work at the Portland Art Gallery or on the Portland Art Gallery website. I am Dr. Lisa Belial, and you have been listening to or watching Radio Maine. Thanks for being here today. Thank you.